For AZPM, I'm Mark McLemore, and this is Arizona Spotlight. Coming up, learn about a major donation of World War II memorabilia to the U of A. A few recommendations for spring reading from visitors to the Tucson Festival of Books. An ode to winter in the desert and the beauty that abounds on Agua Caliente Hill from new contributor Rebecca Doyle. And the premiere of a 10-minute drama written by Alejandro Canelos called Daughter Putting on Airs. Those stories are next on Arizona Spotlight. If you walk around the University of Arizona near the Memorial Student Union, you might notice that everywhere there are reminders of a World War II-era battleship that was named after the 48th state. And as Christopher Conover reports, the collection of memorabilia from that famous vessel is still growing. The ship's bell hangs in a tower on the mall. Anchor chains are part of a fountain near the bookstore. Replica dog tags blow gently in the wind in the middle of a traffic circle in front of the student union. And the outline of the battleship surrounds the mall along with the names of all of the USS Arizona sailors who were killed when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. But what most people don't know about is the special collection in the university library. We do have a large sizable chunk of the ship's superstructure that was reco- recovered from the salvage yard. We have numerous, I mean, thousands and thousands of photographs that were taken on board the ship, but are also Navy-issued materials, correspondence, um, daily orders that just give the, an hourly breakdown of what the duties were on the ship, materials that document the various um, athletic teams that were on board ship, the baseball team, the football team. They had a world-class championship rowing team. That's Trent Purdy, the curator of the USS Arizona Special Collection at the University of Arizona Library. Unlike other collections, the material at the University of Arizona is open to the public. The University of Arizona is a land-grant institution, so our materials are available to all members of the public, not just faculty or students. Um, All you need to visit our materials and view our materials is a uh, photo ID. The university's collection recently got a major donation from the Franklin family who live in Wisconsin. Lowell Franklin says while cleaning out a family home, he came across a box with his father's name on it and inside was a treasure trove of memorabilia from the USS Arizona. I looked at it, and uh, I I knew that it it should be not with us, but where people will be able to see it. And I know that there was a choice between sending it to Hawaii or having it come here, and uh, that's what we wanted to do. Arthur Franklin, Lowell's father, served in the print shop on the USS Arizona until he was honorably discharged from the Navy in the summer of 1941. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, he re-enlisted, but was based in California and did not go back to sea. Lowell says growing up, his dad didn't talk much about his time in the Navy, so the contents of the box, including his Liberty card, which led him back on the ship after shore leave, Pictures of day-to-day life aboard, menus, and mementos filled in some gaps. Lowell's wife, Wendy, says one of her favorite things in the box of memories and memorabilia are the letters between Arthur and his brother, who was a soldier in Europe during World War II. The two are corresponding about, let's do this. You do your part, we'll do our part. We'll make this thing end. And um, very fascinating. I can't tell the stories, some of the things they said, um, but they were, they were committed to making this end. When most people think of the USS Arizona, they think of the attack on Pearl Harbor, not its missions before that. And that's why this donation is special to archivist Trent Purdy. I don't know if most people know that it existed for 25 years prior to that thinking. So it was all over the world. And then it was even stationed in the Pacific Theater as early as the, the early 1930s. So it had a long and uh, 
long history with the territory of Hawaii. Um, and so what's really important about our collection is that it really does document what it was like to be a sailor on a, a super dreadnought battleship. In addition to being available for public viewing, the donation will also be digitally copied and added to the Special Collections online database of material from the USS Arizona. For Arizona Spotlight, I'm Christopher Conover. The annual Tucson Festival of Books sees readers of all ages convene on the U of A campus in celebration of their shared love of the written word. I talked with a few of these visitors on Sunday morning, and here is the long overdue return of a book I love. My name is Amy. Hi Amy, what brings you to the Festival of Books today? Uh, just seeing what they have to offer and looking up new authors and looking up new books. Can you tell me about a book that you've encountered, it doesn't have to be recently, that you would say you honestly love? I am a huge Jane Austen fan, so Pride and Prejudice is one book that I read over and over again, um, and I just love it. There's always something new to find and dive deeper into. Can you give me an example of something in a Jane Austen book that has meant something different to you now as opposed to, say, when you first read it? Well, when I first read it, it was, you know, all about Mr. Darcy, and he was so wonderful and great. Um, but as a, an older woman, a middle-aged woman, if you will, it's finding nuance in um, the Elizabeth character and how she sort of becomes empowered and, and finds herself and stays true to herself. And I love that about her character. Hi, what's your name? My name is Raj Uprethi. And what brings you to the Festival of Books today? Uh, I actually have been volunteering Friday, Saturday, and finally Sunday. And uh, just helping out any way I can. Uh, I've been meeting with a couple of the authors and uh, just buying books, you know, supporting my local community. Terrific. What's a book that you would say you have an emotional connection to? Something you, that you love, that you'd like people to know about? The book I just bought is American Born Chinese by the author Jen Yun Yang. Who's you actually just bought it. How do you know you love it? I've actually read it before. I, I've, I've read it in middle school, read it in high school, read it in college, and uh, I'm reading it again as an adult. I finally have a copy, and it's like, I'm going to try to get it signed. Would you recommend this book to anyone, even people without perhaps a connection to Chinese culture? Absolutely. I'm not Chinese, and it's like, this book spoke to me on an emotional, social, and political level. Absolutely. Hi there. I'm Mark. What's your first name? Julian. How old are you? 13. And what is a book that you think you can honestly say you love? Any Dr. Seuss book. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? Yep. What appeals to you about Dr. Seuss? The rhyming. Mm -hmm. So what's a favorite title? Mm, probably Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> and why would you pick that one? I don't know. It just always stood out to me. All right, well, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. What's Hi. your name? My name is Mercedes. Mercedes, what brings you out to the Festival of Books? Uh, I'm visiting Tucson and I know there's something going on. I wanted to check out the area and it's a beautiful day. Well, everybody's talking about books here, so I want to ask you if you could recommend a book that you think you love. A book that I've had my nose in, I feel like all year, munching slowly, annotating, processing each chapter, uh, is a book called uh, The Body Keeps a Score by, I think, a German psychiatrist or psychologist um, named Bessel van der Kolk, revolutionary book, revolutionary man trying to approach and process and explain how trauma um, leaves an imprint on the body in a way that's physiological, emotional, psychological, and his own advice from his experiences of working with like World War II vets of how to deal with that and how to, um, I don't know, do that as an individual and deal with uh, my specific interest, which is like intergenerational family trauma. So I, it's fascinating. There's so much science in it, and it feels very deeply spiritual in a way I've never encountered in a uh, book about PTSD or trauma. What's something that you feel you read in the book that you've been able to apply personally to your life? Ooh, oh my goodness. Okay, so something I've struggled with in my own experiences um, is being able to kind of put words um, to the traumatic experiences I've, I've had. Um, and I think that's so true for everybody, uh, just because it's a vulnerable situation. And also there's something that actually neurologically happens um, that shuts down that part of your brain because emotional processing and language is different in your brain. And one kind of shuts down as you're experiencing the other. 
So something I'm taking away from that is carving out a space in my time regularly, whether it be daily or weekly, to actually give myself that time to put words to those experiences because that actually facilitates that process of putting it in the past, which is revolutionary to me as an individual. Like I said, most books handling trauma or PTSD, um, Bessel van der Kolk, the author, has just done such an amazing job of explaining that in very layman terms. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> it's a recording device so that I can put your voice on the radio. Does that sound like fun? Do you want to tell me about a book you love? I'm sorry. No? You don't think so? You can say dinosaurs. It's okay. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs? What did you love about that book? I like how like there's different kinds of stuff about them. Yeah. What's your first name? Lynn. What grade are you in? First. Fourth grade? First no, grade. First. first grade. Yeah, people that image that. <laughs> yeah, well that's cool. <laughs>
We add layers as the wind and chill at 5,000 feet reminds us it is winter. We elect to eat our late lunch atop a rock outcrop where we can see snowy mica mountain and the palm oasis of Agua Caliente Park far below. The magic of the desert in winter is to simultaneously contemplate palms and snow and to have the luxury on a Sunday to choose where we place ourselves along this continuum. The bird list on this hike in the middle of the day, in the middle of winter, is short but memorable. Four ravens call and dive near the summit. I find their antics entertaining and wonder if four is sufficient to count as a conspiracy of ravens. Years ago, on a paddling trip in British Columbia, we discussed the collective nouns of various animals and decided many would have made great names for 90s indie pop bands. A conspiracy of ravens, opening for a parliament of owls. As we descend, we cross a wash where Canyon Tohi and Rufus Crown Sparrow intermingle. We pause to observe them. I find the Merlin app helpful with distinguishing calls, but I'm grateful for a proper view of each bird. I find recalling or mimicking sounds challenging, birds or pop music. So seeing a bird while it is vocalizing is especially helpful. I enjoy imagining shapes from saguaros much as others enjoy interpreting clouds. I take more time on the descent, savoring this afternoon light and taking photos of saguaros that I will use in class. As a physical therapist in preschools and elementary schools, I use images from outdoor explorations in my sessions. By the end of the week, we are doing yoga with the saguaros of Agua Caliente Hill. As they imitate the saguaros' poses, the students see many more shapes than I did when taking the photos. One exclaims, it's a duck. And with that, I see a duck in profile, the bill, a short arm on one side, the tail, a longer, lower arm on the other. The desert, in every season, inspires. For Arizona Spotlight, this is Rebecca Doyle. Tucsonan Rebecca Doyle has many published articles, stories, and essays that have sprung from her outdoor adventures. Her five-word motto is write, bike, hike, paddle, bird. Have you got 10 minutes? Then we've got a story for you. And now, a new episode of the radio play series, 10-Minute Dramas. Daughter Putting on Airs by Alejandro Canelos. Character list. Rodney and Florence, a married couple in their mid-50s. And Lenore, their 19-year-old daughter. Setting, the kitchen at home. Lenore is sitting at the kitchen table as her mother, Florence, washes the dishes from dinner. Dad's really being a jerk. Florence doesn't respond. Is it me, or is he going out of his way to antagonize me, like, extra? Florence doesn't turn around. He says the same about you. That's ridiculous. After three months, I expected him to be happy to see me and act like it, but no. He says the exact same thing about you. I don't know how you put up with him, honestly. Especially now that I've gotten out of this stagnant culture. Florence turns around. I'm a part of what you're calling stagnant. Please remember that. Don't put it all on him. You are and you aren't. I'm realizing you're a victim. You've been nothing but loyal and faithful, and he's... Look, he's not a bad person, deep down, and I know you wouldn't be with him if he were, but he's just so backward. In ways I never understood until I got out into the real world. <laughs> you think college is the real world. I mean, I know it's insulated, but it's so diverse in terms of thought and outlook. That's why I love it so much. I feel free for the first time in my life. Free to think the way I want. Florence wipes her hands on a towel. I'll finish these up later. She sits across the table from Lenore. I'm glad you're expanding your horizons. That's what you're supposed to be doing there, and that's what we want for you. Your dad, too. I just don't understand what. If that's what he wants from me, why does he act like everything I say, all my views, are total crap? You haven't been very kind to him these past few days. Since you're asking. Mom, don't start with that, okay? I should be able to say what I think when I want without him putting me down. He puts you down, too, you know. 
You just don't realize it or you're so used to it after all these years. Your father and I have our means of communication and we have our disagreements and it's not for you to judge. Well, fine. I'll try and keep it to myself, but let me just say for the record, he mistreats you. Now that's a big He mistreats you and you don't feel it or even know it because you come from a different generation and I understand it's really not your fault. I don't know what to say. There's nothing to say. From the next room, opera music is heard. Oh, Jesus. See what I mean? He's doing this to bother me. Lenore is growing more agitated. He might as well ask me to leave. She shakes her head in disgust. And maybe I will. He loves his music. He knows how I feel about it. He can't use headphones or take a day off. This is his home. Our home. Why would you want him to change his routine when you come to visit? Just because you've got some new thing against classical music, you used to love it. First of all, I never loved it. I liked it. Sometimes, like a prisoner likes his daily helping. Oh, come on now. Really? Lenore is near tears. Mom, seriously. This is torture. He's doing it on purpose. Can't you just go to your room and listen to your own music with headphones? Sure I can, and God knows I will. Now watch your language. Ugh. I think... Now don't take this the wrong way. But I think you're going through a phase, and I... God, kill me now. If you don't stop interrupting and using the Lord's name in vain, I'm going to end this conversation. Okay. Sorry, it's just really frustrating. Rodney enters. What are you guys talking about? Let me guess. Florence shoots him a look that says, not now. Lenore stares at the table. Just grabbing a beverage, then you can go back to dumping all over me. You see, Mom? This is what I'm talking about. Non-stop antagonizing. Rodney opens the refrigerator and takes out a can of beer. He heads back to the other room. Have fun. Would you mind turning the music down a little, please? Rodney stops and turns. But it's Rigoletto. Which must be Italian for fingernails on a chalkboard. You used to love this. What's with the I used to love stuff? That's your fantasy, okay? I didn't have a choice. The classics never get old. Except they do. They do, okay? Old and moldy, like your mindset. The world has changed, but you won't change with it. I mean, I want us to get along. I do. I know you mean well. You've been a good dad, mostly. Thanks. After a pause, he turns to Florence. Are you moldy also? <laughs> or is it just me? He opens his beer. That's not going to help. Rodney holds up the beer. Are you talking about this? Or this? Turn it off, or I'm out of here. You know where the door is. Why don't you come back when you can behave yourself? Fine. Lenore storms off to her room. Florence frowns and shakes her head. You know what I think? I think if she wants to stay at that school she loves so much, she should pay her own way. That's what I think. I don't think... <sighs> She's an ungrateful little brat. Rodney takes a sip of beer. I wish you two could get along while she's here. You don't think I'm serious, do you? He waits. Do you? No, I don't. Well, I am. He points at Florence. You tell her, all right? Since you're such good buddies. Tell her she can pay the bill for next semester. The invoice is right in the drawer. Matter of fact, I'll go get it. Rodney exits and returns seconds later with a piece of paper. Here it is. He slaps the invoice down on the table. Please tell our daughter that if she has a problem with it, she can come talk to me. He raises his eyebrows. But she better figure out an attitude adjustment if she hopes to change my mind. Lenore enters with a small overnight bag. I'm going to Sylvie's. I'll be back to get the rest of my stuff tomorrow. Take your time. You're going to need it to come up with the money to pay for your own education since you're so enlightened. Lenore turns to her mother. This is what I'm talking about. She starts to cry. Everything is his way or no way. Florence doesn't respond. Her face looks pale. Rodney points at Lenore. You heard me. Rodney exits to the other room. Lenore sits at the table, dropping the bag at her feet. It's abuse, the way he threatens people. Lenore dries her eyes on her sleeve. Florence pulls her chair in closer. I wouldn't assume it's just a threat. Really? Don't push him, okay? He's liable to... When he's angry enough, he can go overboard. So, what you're telling me is he's gotten worse since I left? No, he hasn't. He's the same. You're the one who's changed. How can you... Are you seriously sticking up for him? Still? I'm telling you that you should pick your battles. Do you understand? If I were you, I'd go apologize to him. Apologize for what? You called us moldy. 
Both of us. I didn't call you moldy. I said your mindset was. Look, this isn't just about today. You've been critical of almost everything he's said or done since you got home. It's noticeable. It really is. Well, he's... The music turns off. Lenore lowers her voice. There's a hint of fear in her eyes. You really think I need to? If you don't want to jeopardize your standing with the university, yes. I think you should. Just swallow your pride and do it. Have you ever told him to swallow his pride? Florence doesn't respond. Please answer the question. That's none of your business. Lenore is shaking her head. This is total bull. He's not going to change, all right? And you know what else? Neither am I. Not at this age. At any age. You've both been the exact same way my whole life. There's something to be said for consistency. Maybe. I used to be like you. And so was he, believe it or not. I don't. Anyway, I suggest you go in there now. Do what you need to do. Is he still in there? I'm sure he is. Waiting for you. How does he know I won't just say, forget it, and go do something crazy? Because he knows how much you love school. That is really messed up. Don't you see that? Yes. Lenore is tearing up again. Do you really? I do. All right. Come here. Okay. Lenore goes over to her mother, leans down, and gives her a long hug. She exits with her head hanging low. Florence rises, smiling to herself, and goes back to doing the dishes. The end. You just heard Matthew Staples as Rodney, Betsy Cruz Craig as Florence, and Edith Craig as Lenore. Stage direction by Alejandro Canelos. Directed by Betsy Cruz Craig. Daughter Putting on Airs was written and adapted for radio by Alejandro Canelos from his book, 10-Minute Dramas for the Stage. Listen for more radio drama coming soon on Arizona Spotlight. Thank you for listening. This show is a production of AZPM. The music is by Calexico. The production engineer is Jim Blackwood. Production assistance by Alicia Vasquez. I'm producer and host, Mark McLemore. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.